I want to present an argument to you and make it on your behalf as well that's going to help guide you in responding to this important question. When it comes to racism, are you a non-racist or are you an anti-racist? I have found that people are able to see oppression in its many forms when they are able to own the privileges that they have in themselves. And by privilege, I mean a special right, advantage, or immunity granted or made available only to a particular person or group of people. Here's what I mean. If I were to ask all of you in the audience, how many of you are left-handed? Here's what folks who are left-handed would say about living in a right-handed person's world. They might say that their family's culture discouraged them from using their left hand and even forced them to put their left hand behind their back or even tap it when they tried to use it. They might say that, I remember back in kindergarten, those scissors never worked for me. They might also say that when I sit down to write as a left-handed person, I always get ink and marks all over my arm, and I get spiral marks all up and down my arm. Now, if you are right-handed and you never thought about that, that's a privilege that you have. It's a special right, advantage, or immunity, granted or made available only to right-handed people because those scissors worked fine for me when I was in elementary school as a right-handed person. My colleagues and friends who are white have continued to peel back and uncover what Peggy McIntosh refers to as white privilege, an invisible knapsack of unearned assets that I can count on cashing in every day, but here's the key piece but about which I was meant to remain oblivious. This is my privilege bracelet. As you can see, it has a lot of different colors on it because I have a lot of privilege. These green beads represent my gender privilege. And one of these beads represents the fact that I know whenever I go out into the street, I am not gonna get unwanted comments about my clothing or catcalls directed at me because of my wardrobe. These red beads represent my nationality privilege. And one of these beads represents the fact that I assume people are gonna to talk to me in English when they speak to me. And these blue beads represent my ability privilege. And one of these beads represents the fact that I know I can gain easy access to any building, any time. I have been doing this work as an anti-racist educator for over 25 years. And I remember when I started, because it was during the terrible time of the earthquake in Kobe, Japan, that destroyed the city. And I remember saying to my earliest audiences, Kobe will be rebuilt before racism will be eradicated in this country. And today, Kobe is once again a thriving city, albeit in the time of COVID. So then a central question to this conversation is, how do you define racism? And if I were to ask all of you in the audience, how do you define racism? Your words might include prejudice, stereotype, power, injustice, discrimination, and many others. In 1977, David Wellman authored a book entitled Portraits of White Racism. And in the book, he defines racism this way. The essential feature of racism is not about hostility nor misperception, but rather a system of advantage that is derived on the basis of race. So when I talk about racism, I'm looking through that lens of systems of advantage that are derived on the basis of race. 
I believe that racism is expressed in three different ways, at the individual level, at the cultural level, and at the institutional level. Racism at the, inst excuse me, at the individual level is the racism that we are all familiar with seeing. It's where you know, a black man is arrested for waiting on a business meeting in a Starbucks, or where a black man is, has the police called on him by a white woman watching birds. And he's watching birds, but the police are called on him. Or about the violence that we currently see against the AAPI community. Those are all the things that, and more, constitute individual racism. And Denzel Washington says racism hasn't changed. It's just being filmed. Racism at the cultural level is about the messages we are sent about what it means to be normal. And whoever creates that cultural standard puts themselves at the top of the hierarchy. So not too long ago, pre-COVID, a black high school wrestler was ordered by a white referee to cut off his dreadlocks right in the midst of a wrestling match. In other words, the referee was putting himself at the top of the cultural hierarchy when it came to what he thought was appropriate hair length for a wrestling match. Cultural racism is also expressed in the pushback that Colin Kaepernick and others have received about taking a knee during the playing of the national anthem. And cultural racism is also found in the story of a person's name. Austin Channing Brown writes about this in her book, I'm Still Here, where she describes why her parents gave her the name that they did as they were thinking ahead to the academic and professional experiences that she would have and the doors that we would be open for her with that name, Austin. Racism at the institutional level is deeply entrenched historically in places such as government, education, criminal justice, economic opportunity, and so many more. In a recent ABC News Nightline piece about home refinancing, a biracial couple, a white husband, and a black wife sought to get an appraisal on their home for the purposes of refinancing. The first appraisal came back at $336,000. The couple went to their bank officer. The bank officer looked at the appraisal and thought that perhaps they needed to get another appraisal because that seemed just a little bit low. So the couple did. But this time, only the husband was present. And all representations that there was a black woman living in the house, culture, pictures, everything was removed from the house before the second appraisal, which came back at over $460,000. The economic wealth gap in this country has been growing exponentially, especially over the last 30 years. And currently, the aggregate household wealth for white families in this country is about 17 times greater than the aggregate household wealth for black families. Who is racist is not as important as what are you doing to interrupt these cycles of oppression, these systemic advantages that are based on race. So here's that question once again. When it comes to racism, are you a non-racist or are you an anti-racist? Now I want you to imagine that I've got four boxes up here with me on the stage. And this first box is called the active racist box. And what goes into the active racist box? Well, certainly all those individual acts that Wellman wrote about. Certainly all those misperceptions that Wellman wrote about. But also in this box of active racism would go a history of systemic advantage based on race. S specifically, in my case, that I'm gonna share here with you about economics. 
because we can go back to sharecropping and peonage during the periods of Reconstruction and move on up to 1921 and the destruction of black wealth in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we can move forward then to the end of World War II when black GIs were denied mortgages, instead being redlined into enclaves of disadvantagement. You don't get any equity when you're renting. All the way up through today, with regards to the gentrification practices that are taking place throughout this country. That's the racist box, the active racist box. Now, the second box is called passive racism. And this is one of the places where a non-racist feels comfortable. Because they'll say, you know, I don't support those policies. I'm not doing what those people are doing, discriminating against other people. I'm not like those people in, in that box number one. I'm not a racist. Martin Luther King would remind them, in the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Now here's box number three. Box number three is the active anti-racist box. And anti-racism is a verb. It requires action. Anti-racism is also not just about the black-white dichotomy. Anti-racism is also not just about racism. It requires action. Speak out. Educate others. Get involved. Make your life a have to. Ibram Kendi even asks us to be introspective in our anti-racist work so that we're able to find those places where we may still be complicit in advancing those systems of advantage that are based on race and other areas of oppression. At the Peace and Justice Institute at Valencia College, where I'm blessed to be a facilitator, these actions take place by making human connections with people while we have difficult conversations, courageous conversations, about the extraordinary times in which we live. I said there were four boxes. Box number four, the passive anti-racist box. This is an oxymoron. There's no such thing as passive anti-racism because anti-racism is a verb. It requires action. You can't just be sitting there and saying, I'm passively anti-racist. Because Desmond Tutu would tap you on the shoulder and say, if you are neutral, in the face of oppression, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So there's that question again. When it comes to racism, are you a non-racist? or are you an anti-racist? James Baldwin stated it perfectly. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. May you be well, may you be loved, may you be free of anxiety and worry, hakuna matata. And when it comes to racism, may you be an anti-racist. Thank you.